Good evening. Today is World Book Day. And now more than ever, we are reminded of the power of the written word to entertain, to comfort, to heal, and to give us hope, maybe. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to a conversation with Nyanpeet Award winner and one of the world's most read writers, Amitav Ghosh. This is the first of a conversation in association with the publishing committee within FIKI, the representatives of the publishing industry in India. We live in extremely challenging times. Over the last few years, through his books and various columns, Amitav has been warning us of the grave consequences of climate change and how humanity's indifference is only going to make it worse. Our current times are proof that we have to value the planet and the world around us even better than we always do. On the occasion of the World Book Day again, uh, he will be in conversation with his publisher, Udyan Mitra, about his forthcoming and most powerful new work, The Living Mountain, and talk to us about how we can make a difference. Thank you for joining us. And now I hand over to Udyan Mitra. Good evening, and greetings on the occasion of World Book Day. My name is Udayan Mitra, I'm publisher at HarperCollins Publishers India. And it's a great pleasure to have with us renowned author Amitav Ghosh. And we will be in conversation today. Uh, and the topic is The Living Mountain, a story of the Anthropocene. And um, it's my pleasure, pleasant duty to first uh, introduce Amita very briefly. Uh, I don't think he needs an introduction, but uh, he, he is uh, one of the most renowned and best loved authors of our times. And if, if you ask many of us who love books to name some of our favorite books, uh, uh, some of the titles that will crop up in that list, I'm sure are The Shadow Lines, Calcutta Chromosome, the Glass Palace, The Hungry Tide, um, three books in the Ibis Trilogy, Gun Island, um, The Great Derangement, and most recently, uh, his most recent book, Jungle Nama. Uh, and I know that we have a lot more to look forward to from Amitabh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have you with us, Amitabh, and, and really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Udayan. Thank you very much for doing this. And thank you for that very generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with you. So I would have to, to start off, uh, I mean, uh, our session today uh, takes off from uh, your uh, the uh, title of your forthcoming book, The Living Mountain, which we'll be publishing from HarperCollins in next January, that's coming out in January 22. But it, it is, it, it's a book that is very relevant to our times and uh, the title for this session, The Living Mountain, A Story of the Anthropocene, takes off from that book. So I wanted to start off with that. Uh, so The Living Mountain is this short story. It's a fable. And it is a fable for our times. It's a story about human exploitation, relentless exploitation of uh, natural resources that leads to uh, an environmental collapse. And uh, you can imagine how relevant to our times uh, this is. Amita, what uh, prompted you to write this? How, how did this story come about? And um, also it, it was written in the course of the pandemic, right? Uh, yes, all of that is true. See, the way it, it came about uh, is, uh, is that many years ago, I was invited uh, to give a talk in uh, Singapore. And uh, I think it was 2016 or 2017. Uh, and uh, uh, I started my talk with a, uh, with a story, you know, and, uh, uh, and a part of that story was exactly, uh, you know, the story of the living mountain. And in fact, it made a great impression on the audience. And uh, uh, there, was a, there was a theater director there <clears throat> and he, he went off and actually made uh, uh, a play. He was a, he, a Mexican theatre director. He made a play of it and it was oh, okay. performed and so on. Mm -hmm. I never got to see the performances, but I know that it was performed. But, you know, I myself was not, uh, was not satisfied with that version of the story. And I just put it away, you know, uh, and, and sort of forgot about it. And then uh, during the pandemic, um, uh, 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 someone... Uh, 
a very well-known historian uh, at the University of Notre Dame in uh, in uh, the United States, mm. wrote to me and said she was uh, she was going to be editing uh, a book about the Anthropocene. It was a collection of essays and and short pieces on the Anthropocene, uh, and. Uh, many of the world's leading uh, climate scientists and earth scientists were going to be writing for it. And they wanted something from me too. So this was quite a responsibility. I sat mm. down, I racked my head, I thought of writing an essay. And I, you know, I took several goals at it. And then I, I realized, you know, what am I going to tell anyone about the Anthropocene that uh, these famous uh, scientists uh, mm. won't say better? Mm. And then it struck me that really, the best thing that I can do is that, you know, I'm a storyteller and I should tell a story about the Anthropocene as I, uh, as I perceive it. So that's when I sat down and uh, really completed, uh, uh, you mm. know, the story and somehow it just suddenly gave me an impetus to do it. I would probably never have done it unless uh, um, uh, the editor had asked me to. That's right. right. Yeah. But I, I, so I sat down and I finished it and, you know, I sent it to her in great trepidation, thinking, uh, oh, you know, I mean, these are heavy <laughs> duty scientists and so right. on. <laughs> what will they make of my, of my fable? <laughs> you know, but uh, they loved it. And mm. uh, she wrote back to me saying, you know, I, I want to put this in every, in every school room. I want everyone to read it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's really how, how it went. Yes, and uh, you know, really, I have to say, I mean, I, I'm one of the privileged first people to have read the story. It is, it's a very short story, but it's an incredibly powerful fable. And, and it is just, it just speaks to you cerebrally as well as emotionally. And I'm just waiting for, uh, you know, readers everywhere to, to be able to read it. It's uh, just a wonderful story. Um, now, the, the fable format you, you have been working with, uh, even the even your uh, book, uh, Jangal Nama, which is just out this January, uh, uh, builds on the, the legend of Bon Bibi, which is a story from the Sundarban. And you have, of course, uh, made it your own in, in a way that is uh, really, I mean, I, in, in terms of just... Uh, Poetic skill, I, I found it incredible how, how you have replicated the Dipodipoyer in which the book is originally, uh, in which the legend is originally recounted in, in Bangla uh, in, into, into an English uh, format. But again, it, it, is, it is a fable and it, it is in many ways, though that is a, that's an ages old fable, it is very relevant to our times. Um, Again, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, why you chose to bring new life to, to the Jungle Nama fable and uh, uh, what was that process like? Uh, writing poetry for the, for, for uh, I, I think uh, in terms of a published book, uh, writing poetry for the first time, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, it's interesting that you use the word poetry. I would rather call it narrative verse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it's, uh, it's, it's quite a different thing. I mean, poetry as, uh, say, for example, any of our leading poets, uh, yeah. uh, you know, like Leela Gandhi or Ranjit mm -hmm. Hospite or something. I mean, I, I would not compare uh, this book to, to the kind of work they do. Uh, they're extremely skilled poets and so on. Right. Uh, whereas I'm, I'm sort of recounting the story more in the voice of a folklorist, you know, right. uh, because these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, stories like that of uh, Jungle Nama, the, the, the story of Bun Bibi from the Shundurbun, uh, that is also told in verse, but the people who, yes. uh, who told those stories didn't think of themselves as poets, really. I mean, right. just people who were writing a story that could be chanted. You know, mm -hmm. Therefore, they wrote it in meter and verse. Yeah. I think it's a different, uh, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. there's a difference between the between mm -hmm. the two. And in the same way, I wouldn't say that I consider myself a poet. I consider myself a storyteller. Yes. And I'm. I'm uh, it's just that I'm telling the story in uh, in verse rather than. Verse. Uh, mm -hmm. But I must say there that uh, you know uh, I use this meter Dwipudi Poyar as we call it in Bangla. Uh, which means the two-footed line. These are couplets of 24 syllables each, and uh, you know each line has a break in the middle. But I was—it's uh, a—it's a very remarkable—it's a very remarkable meter, you know. I mean, I mm -hmm. think it's an extraordinarily flexible meter. 
it's beautiful for chanting yeah. or you can say things in so many different ways uh, and I really discovered in using this meter that it's, um, you know, it's got an incredible sort of uh, uh, flexibility as well as a sort of expressive power. And uh, I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, my friend uh, uh, Shukant Choudhury, who is, uh, mm. as you know, one of the great literary critics of our time, yes. and also uh, he understands, you know, he reads Bangla and writes about Bangla. Uh, he just wrote to me to say that he thought what I'd done with it was amazing. And I felt mm. incredibly flattered because, you know, mm. to hear that from someone uh, like Shukanto yeah. is, a, is a very remarkable thing. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've also been working very closely uh, with my Italian translators who are translating it in the same way, you know, using the meter and the rhyme. And they've that, done that such... That would be very interesting. Yeah. Mm. They've yeah. done such a marvelous job. I mean, to read it, you would think it was written in Italian. Yeah. Mm. 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 Uh, it's, so that shows you exactly how flexible and how uh, how powerful this meter is. Yeah, yeah. You know? In in terms of the the, I mean, it's it's a very simple story. It's an episode from the Bonbiri legend, uh, where um, it's a story of this uh, uh, poor uh, sad boy, as they say, Duke, and um, how he is taken into into the jungle uh, by by his uncle Dhona, and and then. Dhona makes a deal with uh, Dukinrai, who's, uh, who's, who's uh, you know, one of the, let's say, gods or demigods of the jungle, uh, who masquerades as a tiger sometimes, uh, and, and uh, just conspires to leave uh, Dukhe there all, all by himself. And, and then uh, he prays to Bon Bibi and Bon, bon Bibi comes to his aid. Um, but Simple enough story, but you know, really at the root of it, there is so much going on in, again in terms of how mankind looks to the jungle as you know this place where, where they can uh, get natural resources from for their own benefit without really pay, paying much of an attention to the you know environmental damage that they might be causing, and. Uh, from from Bon Bibi's point of view, which which Duke then becomes a part of towards the latter part of the narrative, uh, th there is a balance uh, in in the environment. Uh, I found that absolutely fascinating. That you know the, the the way how that is actually built into this into the story. Um, your thoughts on that? Uh, it, it's uh, yeah. Oh. You know, it's a story about finding balance. It's a it's a story mm. about mm. balancing the needs of human beings. Uh, with the needs of other beings, uh, you know, like tigers and the forest and so on. And I think that's what's so powerful about it for me, because, you know, uh, it's often been pointed out that, you know, the stories of forest peoples and indigenous peoples often carry this moral, you know, that you have yes. to, uh, the, bal uh, the needs of human beings have to be balanced against the needs of, uh, you know, the earth, really, the earth and everything, uh, everything that's in it. But, you know, in English, such stories are very rare. You know, if you think of all the stories that are written for children, they're always about, you know, yes. maximize your potential. Uh, you can mm. uh, better, you can, uh, you know, uh, be ambitious, uh, you know, just do it, grab everything you can, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think, I just feel that it's very important, you know, for, uh, for, for this other kind of story to be mm. told, you know, about, uh, about our relationship with the earth. And uh, that's what's actually so urgent and pressing about this story yes, uh, yes. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you mm. know. And uh, it's quite remarkable actually how uh, the story conceives of these kinds of balance, uh, you know, uh, balances, you know, of different kinds of needs. And at the same time, you know, this story, even though it's, too, uh, it's, it's a very simple story at some level, mm. It's also a very psychologically interesting and complex uh, yes. a legend, yes. you know, because you have uh, uh, this poor boy Dukhe being uh, sort of inveiled into going into the jungle with his mm. uncle. His uncle is already rich, but his uncle yes. wants more and more. So, you know, one of mm. the one of the one of the uh, sort of I mean, I'm sure you've seen this in your own life. One of the tropes of uh, life uh, in Bengal and certainly uh, perhaps throughout India is that of the you know tensions between relatives the rich relatives and the poor relative you know the rich relative, the rich relative is always trying to exploit the poor relative so it's a story about you know uh, those kinds of family tensions uh, 
And at yes. the same time, you know, it's a story about sailing. You know, it's about, also, yes, it's about yes. the merchants who go out to sail. And, uh, you know, this is again a theme that runs through so much of Bengali folklore and of right. folk culture. I mean, the, Monash, the story of Monisha Devi, the goddess of snakes, right. is the mm -hmm. same story. Mm -hmm. uh, because Chad Shalagar is a, uh, the merchant, uh, is again a merchant who's a sailor. You know, he right. goes off and, uh, you know, travels uh, here and there. And this is one of the ways in which, uh, you know, the folklore of Bengal is so different. Mm -hmm. uh, from the folklore of, let's say, uh, Bihar or UP, or, you know, uh, for Bengalis, there was no Kalapani, you know. Uh, exactly. They were merchants who, you know, who, who traded, uh, who traded mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, across the Indian Ocean, you know, with Indonesia, with, uh, with Burma, and so on. So mm -hmm. those were the connections that were important, uh, you know, uh, for Bengalis. And at the same time, you know, it's also a story about, uh, about migration. You know, here mm -hmm. in Goa, if I look around, uh, you know, if I, I just have to walk outside and uh, I, I'll see some young Bengali migrant workers. Uh, you know, they right. come from Bengal and they, mm -hmm. they can't make a living in Bengal. Many of them are from the Shundurbun. They come here, mm -hmm. uh, they work, they earn some money. And as you saw during the pandemic, yeah. uh, they got completely stranded and their lives right. were devastated, you know. But again, you know, this is what, uh, uh, you know, young Bengalis have done for, hmm. for centuries. For centuries. Yeah. For centuries. I mean, they've migrated to make a living somewhere else. Yes. So again, that story is very much at the center of this when Duque says to his mother uh, that going abroad is what everyone does. Uh, okay. Amongst boys of my age, yes. all that we discuss, yes. uh, you know. Yes. And it's really true, uh, you know. If you if you see young uh, young Bengalis uh, outside, whether it's in Europe or it's in other parts of India, uh, they all migrate to uh, to find, you know to make a living. I think this is one of the great unnoticed things that people don't seem to mm. uh, uh, to write about very much, which is why the government seems not to have known that uh, in all of our cities are home to uh, literally millions of migrant workers. Yes, because these workers are often, uh, you know, they don't speak uh, necessarily the local language, so they're not on the radar hmm. uh, of the local authorities, uh, you know. Uh, but there's a huge demographic shift that's occurred yes. in India in the hmm. last 10, 15 years. I've certainly seen it, its effects in Goa, in Karnataka, in all the rural, in, uh, in the coastal towns, again, yes. most of the workers are from Bengal. In Bangalore, there are schools where mm -hmm. uh, the children speak more children speak Bengali than Kannada. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a huge demographic shift, and it needs yeah. to be noticed. Yes, yes, yes. One of the things about the pandemic has been, I mean, of course, one of the things has been that it has made a lot of us introspect uh, because we have been in in isolation and and we've been, you know, sitting in in our own households and and doing our household work and then doing, doing our office work. Um, but it's also, I think, taken us back to the stories that sometimes we were beginning to ignore and forget. And uh, uh, very much, uh, I think the Living Mountain and, and, uh, and then the Jungle Nama story uh, are, are very much stories like those. Uh, the Manusha Mongol story, which you mentioned, which, which is uh, very much a part of Ghana Island, is, is it's again, uh, uh, one of those stories that's um, that that strikes deep, but but stories that that we are beginning to forget. Uh, in fact, in in uh, Hungry Tide, I mean, years ago, you you had uh, captured the Bon Bibi story, but then you you came back to it in in Jungle Nama and actually brought it out even more powerfully because now it's in worse form. Um, would you have something to say on on the relevance of, of these uh, folk tales? Uh, folk legends in, in our times, uh, are, are there lessons to be learned there? Uh, and are, are we in, in danger of uh, beginning to forget these stories? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, these stories are incredibly important because as I said, you know, with the, um, with the Monasha Devi legend, for example, yes, the legend yes. of, the, uh, of the goddess of snakes. And again, let's, let, let's, uh, let's not forget that this story is indigenous to Eastern India, you know, yes. it's, uh, it, it exists in Assam, it exists in Bengal and, you know, uh, Tripura, etc. So, mm. uh, you know, these stories actually predate, you know, many kinds of canonical culture, you mm -hmm. know. 
Uh, and uh, they are so important because uh, really what they do is that they reflect the ecology and the environment That's right. uh, that they emerge out of. Mm -hmm. uh, the Manisha Devi stories, for example, are all about um, natural disasters. You know, mm. uh, Manisha Devi is the goddess of snakes, but she's also the goddess of natural disasters. So, uh, you know, you see in those stories, famine, drought, uh, you know, floods and storms and so on, you know, and of course, snakes, which are so much a part of the ecology of, of, of Bengal and uh, of, um, of India, you know. So, you know, these stories are all, the Manisha Devi story is so much about finding a balance between the needs of humans and the needs of the earth. Hmm. It's something we have completely forgotten now, you know, yeah. and that is really what uh, uh, what the planetary crisis is about. Yeah. As you said, you know, we humans have been treating, uh, or, you know, what we should rather say is that, you know, what started in the 17th century with Europeans uh, invading uh, America, then invading the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. seeking the, um, uh, the East Indies, they began to think of, you know, what are really the precious treasures of the earth. You right. know, uh, they started thinking of these things as resources, which That's exist right. only economically. You know, right. these resources had no moral value attached. Yeah. They yes. had no aesthetic values attached. They were judged only in terms of profit. Yes. You know, and as we go on, we see, you know, what grows out of thinking of things as resources is the resource curse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so for example, uh, uh, say with the, with clothes, you know, uh, the uh, the Dutch seized the islands where cloves used to grow. This was in the East Indies. Yes. You know, and the, they turned those islands into wastelands, essentially, yeah. you know, and that was way back in the 17th century. Yeah. Uh, you see this with in India most dramatically because, uh, you know, uh, the English began to uh, grow opium to send to China yeah. hmm. and they grew it almost entirely in Bihar. Yes. You know, India became then the world's largest uh, opium producer and it hmm. is still today. A fact little known to most people, but uh, still the largest producer producer of uh, legitimate opium, you know, mm -hmm. or medical opium. But you know the places where these uh, where, where this opium was grown uh, to this day, uh, they're uh, they're they're laboring under essentially a resource curse. Yes. You know, just just think, you know, Bihar historically has been the richest, most productive uh, part of India. You know, and mm. rich not mm. just in terms of money, but also, you know, Bihar produced uh, the great intellectuals, of course. Uh, you know, I mean, the great writers, the great, uh, I mean, uh, you know, going back to Ashoka and even before mm -hmm. Palidas, I mean, they're all from that, uh, from that region. How yeah. did this region become the poorest part of India? And essentially, it was under this colonial agricultural economy where they were yeah. made uh, essentially to produce this so-called resource. Yeah. And, you know, there have been studies which show to this day that the districts where they grew uh, opium hmm. are much poorer in development outcomes uh, than neighboring right. districts where uh, opium was not grown. Hmm. You know, they lack, uh, you know, there's much more criminality, there's much more, uh, there's a, a fewer schools. It, it, in every way, they lag behind, you know. Hmm. So this resource curse extends into the future. And you look yes. again at the resource curse of oil. Country hmm. after country has been yeah. devastated by oil. I mean, the entire Middle East is like, is in flames to this day, you know, because of uh, the so-called resource that they uh, that they possess. Yeah. But even more than that, it's the entire planet is now laboring under the resource. Right. You know, I mean, that's what it is. That's what this colonial extractivist economy has given to the world. Yeah. And today, in effect, these techniques of colonialism have been adopted universally. By countries everywhere. Indeed, and you know, I, I mean, one of the really fascinating things about the Living Mountain is, in fact, that, that you know, very briefly but very powerfully, you bring this out that uh, this this whole uh, exploitation and of what 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 humans think of as natural resources actually stems from a disconnect between. The, the human mindset and and between uh, nature and and 
the, the there are these people called the adepts in 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 the living mountain who who are actually able to connect with the so, the, so this is great mountain called Mahaparvat, and they, they are able to connect with uh, so to speak the spirit of the mountain uh, through their feet. So I, I won't give away the story, but uh, uh, but the but the uh, the disjunct between people who are able to connect and people who are not able to connect but want to exploit, that, that is made crystal clear. So, um, I, I, uh, so we, we are doing this on the occasion of World Book Day, so I, I wanted to close uh, asking you your, your thoughts on, on books over the last couple of years. I mean, books have, I think, become more dear to us than, than ever before. Uh, they helped us sustain through some of the most difficult times that many of us have seen or are likely to see. Um, your own books, uh, so, I mean, for, for, a, for a time last year, publishers in India were reduced to being able to publish only e-books, which was a first for our times. And then I, in the same year or in the same, uh, let's say, 12-month period, we were able to publish something like Jungle Nama, which is such a wonderful collaboration between you and Salman Thor uh, and those illustrations and then the words come together. And now, of course, there's an audiobook version coming as well. So, so on, on multiple platforms, I mean, uh, books have been speaking to us uh, and have been sustaining us. I just wanted us to close with a, a remark or a thought from you on that. Well, I have many thoughts. First of all, let me say that uh, you know the whole designing process and the whole process of making jung Jungle Nama occurred yeah. during the pandemic uh, over calls like these. And yeah. uh, really, that was an extraordinary thing. And I must say, the HarperCollins team was absolutely fantastic. And uh, Bonita Shimre, your colleague uh, your, who designed the book, yeah. uh, to my mind, has done an absolutely splendid job. I mean, I just uh, I just love how the books come out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's even more than me. Salman loves the way it's come out. And he's very <laughs> particular. So uh, it was really just a wonderful thing to go through this whole process uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, yes, you're right. I mean, <clears throat> you know, books have been so important for all of us, you know, in this uh, in this whole terrible time, and it's really sustained us through this whole uh, this whole uh, terrible time. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I do believe I saw somewhere the other day that actually book sales have gone up uh, during they have, the pandemic. They have indeed. They have. But uh, it's been uh, uh, it's uh, it's not sort of gone up uh, equally, so that uh, you know, authors who already had a presence. <laughs> have uh, continued to sell as usual, or, uh, whereas it's become uh, very difficult for younger starting authors hmm. uh, to actually establish themselves at this time, I think, because, you know, they, more than anyone else, uh, really need, uh, you know, to be out and about and, uh, you know, doing bookstore readings and so on. Yeah. So I really feel for them, you know, I think it's very, yeah. it's, it's been, it's been differentially hard, you know, it's been very hard on, uh, on younger authors. And it's even been very hard on uh, authors in general because uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen uh, on social media many authors have had a very hard time just coping with the conditions, you know, uh, writing fiction uh, mm -hmm. under these conditions of yeah. Yeah. constraint. No, for, for the industry, uh, it's been a very challenging time, but it, it's, uh, it's incredible to, to see how, you know, people have survived, how people have been able to sustain themselves and, and 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 the the you know the creative outpouring that that's that's been going on. I mean, the number of manuscripts we've been receiving, the quality of those manuscripts is, is just uh, so heartening to see. So, so I I think I think that there there's there are good times ahead. I hope <laughs> beyond this bump. So, <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amitabh. Thank you for joining you. us. I, I I think this would be a very special occasion for for all our readers and book lovers in India. They're, I love uh, watching you and uh, listening to your, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you very much, Uday. Thank you.